friends, good afternoon. Good afternoon if you're uh, in this space, and good afternoon if you're on that space. And if you're watching live or if you're going to watch later, my name is John Wilkinson. I'm the pastor here at the Presbyterian Church of Chestnut Hill. It's great to see people out. And we want to do one thing before we do the main thing. And um, we want to say thank you to a very special person who has invested time and energy and wisdom and resources to make this series what it is. And recently, Stan Elwell sent us an email saying he's been really grateful to be a part of this endeavor for so many years, and it's going to take a step back. He's not entirely disappearing, but taking a step back from the planning team and everything else. And Mary Angela and I thought it would be good just to take a moment to thank Stan for all the effort and all the work and all the energy and insight he's given to this effort. So Stan, come forward just for a minute. Say thank you, and we have a little gift for you that Mary Angela has. Sure you Why don't you explain what the gift is, Mary Angela? If yes. you don't mind. <laughs> so this is a book that we give um, our speakers and presenters. But uh, Stan bought me the original version. It's called the Intellectual Devotional. It's 365 interesting factoids, things about different topics. This one is specifically about biographies of interesting people in our world and in our culture, which I don't think he has, so I'm hoping he doesn't have this one, so we thought you might find that one very interesting. Uh, these are every Barnes and Noble shop, sometimes they're sold out, but they really are fascinating. And, uh, my friend, nice so Mary Angela, you wrote a little novel in the inside <laughs> cover. Of this. Something you used to read later today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you ask if you're always right, and you are always right. <laughs> Thanks so much. And uh, I tell you, one, one of the fun things about this, in addition to listening to speakers, is to get acquainted as I've had the chance to do, uh, while John Lockwood was still here, to have um, a whole audience. Probably never again to be that crowded because of the speed. But having a whole audience of uh, interesting people, guests, and uh, people who partake in all these activities, and uh, uh, they come from principally Mount Airy and Chester Hill, as you know, but from the surrounding townships and communities uh, in Montgomery County. And uh, between what's going on here and what Mary Angela and John do. Center of the Hill. It's really kind of a uh, highlight for this community. And uh, it's good to see out the space. Well, thank you, Stan. Thanks you couldn't do lot. this without you. And, and again, he's not disappearing, just stepping back a little bit, because he's got too much wisdom and experience for us to totally let that go away. Well, it's my great honor to introduce our speaker for today, the Reverend Dr. Beth Pessel. I think we've known each other for a long, long time, longer than, let's not even say how many numbers, but Beth and I were colleagues and friends long ago in life in the Presbyterian Church and kept kind of coming back to contact and then going apart and coming back together, and we've reconnected in this way, in this place, in a very important way. So you know about Beth's biography, but let me read it a little bit. She began her tenure as the Executive Director of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia in July of 2019. And if you don't know about the Athenaeum, you should. Uh, get on their email list, go to their programs, go on their website. It's terrific, terrific stuff for those of us who care about history and current events and, and how things come together or Philadelphia history around architecture and other things. You really should know about their program. And it's a great, even a great weekly email you can get if you don't dip, dip, deep, uh, dig in even deeper than that. So anyway, she's been doing that since July of 2019. And prior to that, served as the executive director of the Presbyterian Historical Society. And if you don't know about that great organization, that's another conversation that I'm glad to share with you. But it's a, a great resource that happens to be in our city uh, and is one of the best kind of um, historical, archived, uh, religious uh, sites in the country and maybe beyond the country in terms of what it has to offer and what it can share. So again, that's for another conversation. Uh, Beth holds a PhD in U.S. History from Texas Christian University, Go Home Frogs, an MA from Binghamton University, an MDiv, Master of Divinity from San Francisco Theological Seminary, and a BA from the University of California in Davis. She has this great combination of being a Presbyterian minister and a really, really skilled historian 
and oftentimes bringing those themes together in important ways that continue to help us connect life in the United States, life in the religious communities, um, and the topic she has today, talking about the experience of the Japanese internment camps, continues to resonate with our life together. So I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to introduce to you all, and to you all online, my very good friend, Beth Hustle. Beth, welcome. Thank you, John. Yeah, for an idea of how long it's been, I did not yet have children at that time, and now the oldest is in college, so. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> we were very, very young then, because we're still very young. So. Well, I, it's, it's such a, a delight. I really appreciate Mariangela asked me, I think before COVID hit, come speak, so we've had to reschedule numerous times my talk, and I, it kind of went off my radar, and last week I said, oh wait, I'm seeing something on my calendar next week, so I better prepare. Um, so this will be a little bit ad hoc, I've, I've got a talk, but I also, I'm not necessarily going to stay on it, on it, so, um, but my, uh, my dissertation work for my, my, my doctorate was looking at religious freedom, religious issues in Japanese American incarceration camps. Um, I had, I'll tell you, I was, I, I was a pastor's kid, the kid of uh, missionaries, Presbyterian, a grandchild of Presbyterian missionaries, it goes way back in my family, it's too far back, and I always wanted nothing to do with religion outside of church. Um, but as an historian, I kept finding myself coming back again and again and again to religious topics at every level of my studies, looking at, um, at, uh, at, at social justice organizers in, uh, in, in the United States for my bachelor's thesis, for my master's thesis, looking at um, male-female relationships in a Quaker community in, uh, in Westchester, and, um, and then for my doctoral thesis, I knew I, I was really um, concerned uh, in, in the beginning of the early 2000s with the way that uh, after 9-11 that people were using, it was interesting to me the way that people were using their faith, wherever they were on the spectrum, they were using their faith to justify how they thought Muslims should be treated. Um, whether they were Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or what, they would use their faith as a foundation to say either, you know, don't let another Muslim into this country ever, they should all be killed, or, you know, we're called to treat one another as brother and sister. And uh, I made me start thinking about Japanese American incarceration during World War II and, and saying, hey, what did people do then? And, um, as I started going in, looking into it, I realized it was a little hard to pinpoint um, necessarily how people's responses tied to their, their faith. Um, but I did find a group of missionaries, an uh, interdenominational group of missionaries. Um, we've been in Japan for a long time, some in Korea, who became the intermediaries during the war between the Japanese Americans in the camps, congregations outside the camps, and the federal government. And they quickly creeped into doing a whole lot of things that in some, sometimes were helpful for the Japanese Americans, um, were being helpful allies, and sometimes were rather paternalistic. Um, so my, my dissertation looked at that relationship, followed starting in Japan about 40 years before the war, what those missionaries were doing, and looked at the relationships in the camp. Um, but I feel like this is an issue that has not gone away. We're in Asian uh, American Pacific Islander Month this month, and we have all been aware since the start of COVID of this drastic increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Um, and we're also aware of all the conspiracy theories that circulate throughout our country that forget our history, that deny our history, that deny the Holocaust, that deny what happened to Japanese Americans, that deny how we have treated people over time. And so it really is important, I know we were talking at our, our table before we started, that we continue to educate ourselves, that we continue to be people who have the capacity to make corrections when people are saying things that are false.
So this looks a lot at uh, religious freedom, but I will look at touch at some other areas too. I wanted to start first with um, a, 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 a Quaker missionary, Esther B. Rhodes, whose papers are at Swarthmore College. Um, she had been in Japan and then she came back here and she worked in Philadelphia during the war. Um, she has an undated essay that she probably wrote shortly after the Second World War when she was sort of reflecting on all that had happened during the war. And she reflected, quote, that the evacuation of all Japanese Americans from the West Coast during World War II is indeed a black mark in our history. She went on, our American record of treating persons of other races as equals has not been good. Now, to have someone saying that in the mid-20th century is a lot of self-reflection and self-awareness. Her clarity about the history of American race relations that served as the precursor to the mass incarceration of 120,000 American citizens and residents of Japanese ancestry by their federal government during the war echoed the, the words of another Presbyterian missionary to Japan, Gladys Walzer, who talked about the quandary that Japanese Americans faced, perhaps that all of us as Americans faced in how we treated um, our, our, our neighbors who were of Japanese ancestry. Of the Nisei, our second generation, she said, they are determined to win a place in the America they love. And then she asked, shall it always be their fate to be thought Japanese when in America and Americans when in Japan? Or, and this question was for everybody else, will we by fair play give them the right that is theirs by birth to be Americans? We know those words echo today when we've had people talking about changing the Constitution and, and taking away birthright citizenship. Um, for, for people and not make it, let, allowing that to be a, 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 a right that everybody has. Shall we let them be Americans and treat them as Americans when they are Americans? Well, Japanese Americans, like all, but well, I always do this, I put it the wrong thing. It is not the middle. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm not the best at these. Um, Japanese Americans, like all Japanese Americans in the 19th and early 20th century, faced discrimination. They were denied naturalization rights as citizens. Many, uh, many states on the West Coast in particular <coughs> passed laws that denied people ineligible for citizenship, which basically meant Asian Americans, um, the right to buy property, sometimes to own businesses, to own majority share in corporations so that if they worked together and they had a, a white friend buy them property and then they joined together and, and, and tried to hold shares in a business on that property, they would say that was illegal. They faced major discrimination, legal and social, in their efforts to carve out a life in the United States. This was the Shibuya family, um, an example of a family who um, came to, to the United States, uh, to California, and they became very, they had $60 in cash a basket of clothes when they came in 1904, um, before before all uh, Asian American immigration was was halted, um, and uh, he became a very prosperous business owner raising uh, chrysanthemums. Um, they had six children. They all went into the incarceration camps and lost their business in the course of the war. So, an example of one family. They were denied citizenship because of their their ethnicity. Um, so that first generation, like Mr. and Mrs. Shibuya, worked hard to ensure better opportunities for their children. Many went so far as to send their children, if they were Buddhist, to still send their children to Christian Sunday schools and churches in the belief that the Christian religion would make the second generation, or Nisei, more American. So we have first generation is Issei, second generation is Nisei. Third generation we won't talk about so much, but there's Sansei um, is, are the terms for them. So they worked really hard to help, help create their place in the American polity. But after Pearl Harbor, they learned the limits of their efforts to ensure their place as Americans. Within days of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Harbor the Federal Council, Council of Churches of Christ in America, which was an umbrella organization 
for most of the Protestant denominations in the United States, issued a statement calling upon all Americans to, quote, maintain a Christian composure and charity in their dealings with the Japanese among us, and to demonstrate a discipline which, while carefully observing precautions necessary to national safety, has no place for vindictiveness. So you'll notice already in their statement, which is, uh, which is meant to, to act as, as, as an ally for Japanese Americans, already sets them apart as others. If you heard, they called them Japanese. Now, if you were a first or second generation Italian or German or English person, you would not be called the English, the Italian, the Germans. You'd be called the German Americans, the Italian Americans, the English Americans, or just Americans. So already, even <coughs> allies were setting Japanese Americans apart as, as other as foreign. The call to charity, however, did push back against these decades of, uh, of anti-Asian vitriol in the United States, uh, while unintentionally, you know, kind of playing into that belief that Asian immigrants and their children would never assimilate. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. So when, when right after, it's interesting, right after Pearl Harbor, there was not really a lot of um, of violence against Japanese Americans. There was not immediately any call to say, hey, we're worried about Japanese Americans uh, in, in, in our country. It was really only a month or two later um, that mostly business interests and politicians were looking at um, the coming primaries and mid midterm elections started to say, you know what, it could be good for us. You know, if you're a business owner, you're looking at Japanese Americans on the West Coast who either are successful with, with fishing or perhaps they have taken land that nobody says anything can be grown on and have made really successful farms. And all of a sudden you want that land and you want that fishing business because you're going to make more money. You don't want the competition. So there was a lot of self-interest in this ri rising call for something to be done about the Japanese among us. Um, but but so, so finally, Roosevelt signed this executive order 9066 in February 1942. He gave in. Oh, I, here's, I love this little picture of the kids. As you can see, um, this was at a school in San Francisco early 1942, before Pearl Harbor. Look at how diverse that that mix of children is. This is what we want to think of, I think, most of us as, as America, and um, this was what was really torn apart. So those are the exclusion orders um, that, that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed in February 1942, Executive Order 9066. It enabled the military to forcefully remove any group of persons from any area of the United States for any reason deemed necessary. Though this was written very ambiguously, broad, it was intentionally vague, but everybody knew that this order was intended to address people of Japanese ancestry in the United States. It was not pointed at the Germans, German Americans, people of German ancestry, or people of Italian ancestry. It was, it was meant for Japanese Americans. Now many Americans who paid any attention to what was going on, and you know, some of you may have been young children during that time, um, your parents may have been aware of what was going on, may not have. Think about all the stuff that's going on in our lives right now, and how up to date are we with what's happening in Ukraine, for example, or with inflation, probably inflation we're aware of. But you know, there's so many things happening that, that we kind of tune it all out. Our nation was at war, we were gearing up for a war, so a lot of people may not have even paid attention to what was happening. But, but many, if they were paying attention, would have agreed with Colonel Carl Bendenson, who helped the Roosevelt administration craft this policy. When he reasoned, in the case of the Japanese, their oriental habits of life, their and our inability to assimilate biologically, and what is more important, our inability to distinguish these subverters and saboteurs from the rest of the mass made necessary their class evacuation 
on a horizontal basis, meaning just everybody, not why don't we why don't we identify who we think is problematic and evacuate them or you know put them in camps and let everybody else continue to live their lives. We can't tell the difference who is who. He went on, in the case of the Germans and Italians, such mass evacuation is neither necessary nor desirable. So if you're German-American, Italian-American, we can tell if you are loyal or not. But if you're Japanese, Japanese-American, we can't. Decades of anti-Asian sentiment enabled leaders of our country, along with ordinary citizens, to join with Lieutenant General John DeWitt, who was head of the Western Defense Command, to declare that the Japanese race is an enemy race, and it makes no difference whether he is an American citizen, he is still Japanese. American citizenship does not necessarily determine loyalty. A statement that has been boiled down to, once a Jap, always a Jap. Now here's a few just, uh, just to see. So here's the expulsion zones. You can see it was even printed up. The military had several zones, and if you were Jap of Japanese ancestry, you could not enter. Um, they originally had, uh, they had one zone, I'll show you the map soon, but um, some Japanese, Japanese uh, family, Japanese and Japanese Americans in the, in the western coast were trying to figure out where they needed to be. And not all of California had been labeled an exclusion zone initially. And so some families moved to other parts of California that were not in the exclusion zone. And then when the government, the military changed and made all of California and the western half of Arizona an exclusion zone, they had to move yet again. Um, and at that point, as people were trying to leave the exclusion zone to other parts of the country, the governors along all the border states said, you're not welcome. Colorado was the only state that said, we will accept you into our, into our state. But most said, you're not welcome. People had to turn back again and um, be sent into camps. So this, we all love Dr. Seuss, but he was, uh, he did, a, he worked for the, for the government during World War II and he did a lot of propaganda uh, cartoons. So this isn't necessarily what we like to think of with Dr. Seuss, it kind of has scarred my, my feeling about him forever, but this comic sort of uh, represents how people saw Japanese Americans. The, the idea of the fifth column, um, that they are, um, there, there's the four columns of, of the, the enemy troops, and the fifth column is, are those people who are embedded within, uh, behind, behind our lines. So the idea that all, all people of Japanese ancestry were a fifth column waiting to receive from, uh, from Japan dynamite so they could sabotage here in the United States. And you see he shows this huge, huge phalanx coming all the way from Washington, Oregon, and California, waiting for the signal from home. Cartoons like this played into this idea that no one of Japanese ancestry could ever truly be American or be loyal. I had to throw this in just to counter it. Remember who we're actually looking at. And here's a, here's a Japanese American family on the train being sent to a camp from their home, waving the flag. And here's some more propaganda for you to see. Um, you say, uh, this one I think is interesting, uh, and we'll get to my argument, one of my arguments too, is that part of how freedom, or how, how Americanness was being defined was if you fell into uh, one of these, you know, preferably Christian, Jewish is starting to be accepted and Catholic is starting to be accepted as part of the uh, American polity. Um, so if you are not, and many Japanese people were not Christian or Jewish or Catholic, you might not be American. And the other one, they, uh, these, these drawings, stereotypical, what you look like if you're Chinese or what you look like if you're Japanese, supposedly to help protect Chinese Americans from attacks because China was our ally. Um, so this was supposed to be a handy dandy little um, card you can carry around and look at someone. Oh, you must be Chinese, so I'll leave you alone. You're Japanese. You're the enemy. Some people disagree with Bendit's and DeWitt's racism, but Esther Rhodes points out that people are so busy that even when they have personal friends among the Japanese, they are too occupied with their own affairs to realize what is happening. 
We can all say that about our own lives. Most of the public, she contended, paid so little attention that they wrongly believed the military completed the forced evacuation of all Japanese Americans, about 120,000 people from the West Coast, in the American way, and are quite willing, she said, to forget about the whole problem. By the American way, people would have met, she said, expelled with kindness and a smile. These missionaries that I've, I've mentioned name the illness that plagued the United States in the 1940s and that plagues us still, a limited image of what makes someone American, as we looked at those slides earlier. A tendency to equate Americanness with whiteness and Christianity, or in other words, a deep uneasiness about the nature of our national identity, about what makes a person American. These questions about what makes someone American create an ambiguous and ever-shifting platform on which to prove one's loyalty, particularly in this situation. One of my favorite scholars is Duncan Eugen Williams, and in his book American Sutra, he argues that an enduring nativist ideology that conflates a hierarchy of race, white at the top, and religion, Christianity, as essential to American identity often comes to the fore during times of social, economic, and political uncertainty. And we've seen that. If we look at our, our, our history, we, we can see this playing out. This tendency leads to the denial of citizenship rights to entire communities of people who do not fit into a narrow conception of American. It is really the literal othering of citizens and residents. So during World War II, both Buddhist and Christian Japanese Americans experienced this othering as a casting out into a literal state of limbo. Literal. First generation immigrants, or Issei, already denied citizenship, and their citizen children were denied basic due process rights. They were not given the opportunity for a hearing, for the capacity to prove their, their loyalty to the United States before they were summarily told that they had to leave their homes, their businesses, their schools, their lives, their bank, bank accounts were, were, were put in, uh, were frozen, and they had to go into these camps. So they lost this right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, the right to hearing, the right to the protection of property. They were rounded up and removed, often with only days or weeks notice from their, from, from their lives, and they were placed in desolate camps on um, isolated federal land behind barbed wire with armed guard towers. And I've heard some people say, oh, it's a lie, there weren't really guard towers, there really weren't, and the, the soldiers weren't armed. There were people who were shot and killed in these camps because they got too close to the barbed wire, or they wandered out of it, and they were shot and killed people who had no charges against them, except for being of Japanese ancestry. So this is at uh, the Minidoka camp, kind of see how desolate it is. And has anybody visited one of the, uh, one of the camps, ever and seen one? It's worth visiting if you are out traveling out west and um, and the interesting thing too, all of, almost all of them were put on federal land and um, that was very desolate, but the, 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 the government's hope was that the Japanese would use their wonderful agricultural skills to irrigate this land and turn it into farms that when the, whenever the war was ended and they were released to wherever, whatever happened to them afterwards, the government would have thriving, profitable land that they could sell or commercialize or do whatever they wanted with it. Um, so this was part of the plan uh, with the camps. So stripped of their rights as citizens and residents of this country, Japanese Americans were forced to negotiate uh, and prove themselves for every right and recognition that was taken for granted by their um, former white American neighbors. In the camps, Japanese Americans fought against nihilism and despair. Their faith in America, deeply shaken, many dug deep into their experience to create new expressions of belonging. They challenged the definition of American that excluded them and other non-white or non-Christian communities. In fact, a good number of Japanese Americans after the war became part of the long civil rights movement. They fought discrimination against Af uh, African Americans and others here in the United States. They fought apartheid in South Africa, 
Uh, they created Asian American liberation theologies, and they expanded the collective American imagination around national identity. And if we can recall from the, from the 70s and early 80s, they also led the first successful reparations movement in the country um, to receive a paltry $20,000 for every living survivor of the incarceration camps um, at that time. So how labeled always Japanese, never American, always a potential saboteur and never loyal, did Japanese Americans find ways to express their Americanness? and their right to be a part of this country. A lot of good work has been written. Uh, my, my dissertation scholars said it's, you know, it's really kind of a, a cottage industry. There's so much wonderful work out there, and I've got a, a, a reading list at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll leave up at the end. Um, so a lot has been written by scholars and by activists and novelists about how Japanese Americans challenged the uh, denial of their rights and their place in this country through civil disobedience. People like, Gordon Hirabayashi, who, who at, at the beginning refused to obey those exclusion orders and signed himself up to be sent off to a camp and was arrested and um, worked with members of the ACLU to take this to trial and um, was found guilty all the way to the Supreme Court, found guilty of violating federal, federal orders. Um, those, those orders were finally taken up again and looked at in the 1980s by a lawyer named Peter Irons. And in 1987, um, through quorum nobis, the, the charges were vacated. Not because they were wrong, but because uh, Peter Irons found, found some malfeasance among government and, and how government agencies and how they handled the, the case and the withheld evidence. Um, which is important to know. Some of these cases have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has never said we were wrong. Um, they, they still stand and can be used as precedent for the future. There's also others who, who refused to be, um, to serve in the military. In 19, early 1943, winter of 1943, the federal government, working with the Japanese American Citizens League, decided, hey, maybe it would be a good idea we had a lot of Japanese Americans, particularly in Hawaii, who were serving in the military as of Pearl Harbor. They were all thrown out of the military. Um, some even tried to, you know, multiple times to, to enlist and were denied the right to enlist. But in 1943, they thought, well, maybe this will help our public relations problem <laughs> if we allow, if we create a contingent, a regiment of, of Japanese Americans. We realized we created this mess. We're saying, Japanese Americans, we put them in the camps, now we're changing our story, we're saying we're just keeping them there to protect them, not because they're disloyal, and we really want to get them out of the camps and into other communities, but nobody wants a Japanese American in their community because the government has just told them they all had to be rounded up and put into camps because they're pretend, I mean, catch 22, right? So they thought, well, we'll, 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 we'll create this system where we can, we can uh, route more people out, whether to go to school, to get jobs, or to uh, serve in the military by creating a questionnaire. The problem, though, is that there were two questions on the questionnaire. Um, it was ended up being called the loyalty questionnaire. There were about 31 questions. But the final two, one was, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States of America? Um, and the second was, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the U.S. from any and all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government, power, or organization? Now, some people did sign up to serve, but others said, wait a minute. First, you're asking me to serve in the armed forces when you are not freeing my family. They're still behind bars. So why am I going to fight for freedom if my family does not have freedom and their rights? Second of all, my parents. My parents are not allowed to become citizens of the United States. What happens if the United States loses this war and my parents have just forsworn allegiance to the Japanese emperor? They become stateless people. What happens to them? So there were a lot of people who said, we're not gonna sign it, who refused to sign it. The government then said, you all are disloyal, and they created one of the camps, Tool Lake in California, 
they moved out everybody who signed the, the, the questionnaire and put them into other camps and they made that into a segregation camp. And they, the government said, hey look, we found the worst ones and we put them into Tool Lake. These are people who are bad. But many of these were young men and their families who came with, who decided to, to stand with them on it, um, who believed that they were standing up for their rights as Americans and uh, their civil rights and their constitutional rights. Uh, it divided, it divided the Japanese American community too. It was really hard. But then there were others who said, I'm gonna show that I'm American by serving in the armed forces. And that was their way of standing up and saying, I'm an American and I count and I'm going to help this country fight against Hitler. So we can talk more about that during Q&A if you want. But I want to look very briefly at the ways that the, also at the state and their well-intentioned allies try to limit the religious freedoms of Japanese Americans in the name of America. And how in spite of these uh, efforts, Japanese Americans challenged the idea that white Christianity is the only basis of our nationality. So this, uh, this was actually probably a sign put up uh, in front of a, a Chinese American or a Filipino American um, store. I'm American, but it kind of gets to the point, very poignant. So here we see, for example, here are some, some, some uh, Japanese American uh, who were serving the military intelligence decoding, um, and then others uh, this first day on the bright side, the first day of the trial of 63 uh, Heart Mountain in, in incarceration camp draft resistors. So you see young men who are in both sides claiming claiming how they, they believe they best can claim their rights to be American. And here's the loyalty questionnaire. Just two pages, it was four pages. But, uh, so here are the camps where they were sent. Um, before going to the 10 relocation war, war in the relocation camps, which were euphemistically called relocation camps, but more correctly, at that time, were also, through the government, were called internment camps. Um, that has become a really loaded term because of the Holocaust and where Jews were sent to be killed, and so that term is not tended to be used. Most, most often now we talk about them as incarceration camps, prisons. So you can see here, they were sent first to um, uh, temporary camps, assembly centers that were run by the military, who were just not the right people to run the camp. So you can see these little, the little circles. They were all sent off these camps. These were mostly fairgrounds, and like the horse stalls were turned into uh, housing for families, so a family might have a horse stall for their family, uh, still stinking of, of horse manure not really well cleaned out, uh, but they were sent there while the camps were being built. Many Japanese Americans were told, hey, you know, you go ahead and you go and you help build these new camps for, um, for folks when they come in, so they might get out and, and do that. Uh, so then they were sent to uh, uh, these other camps, and the war relocation centers are all uh, in uh, triangles. So mostly on the West Coast, the red line talks about the exclusion zone where Japanese Americans were not allowed to go unless they were given a letter of permission signed from the government. So they were mostly on the West Coast except for the two over here in Arkansas. Um, th these were really, really difficult. They, they, had, uh, they were hostile to these, these populations. There were communal bathrooms which broke down uh, privacy and modesty, communal dining halls which broke down family cohesion. People no longer ate together as families. Kids went off and ate with their friends. There was, you know, the families were falling apart. Um, there were no schools in the, in the, in the relocation, in the assembly centers. Uh, recreational facilities or other elements of daily life which threatened to break down people's psychology and sense of well-being. By the time they reached the WRA, the War Relocation Assembly camps, they had a better access to uh, here. Um, right here. So they got to these camps and they had to figure out what to do with their lives. Um, first off, if you're a Christian, the, the, when they got, especially when they got to the, the War Relocation camps, um, the government told them that if you were Protestant, you had to be in one camp, no matter what your denomination, one, one church, no matter what your denomination. So Episcopalians and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Baptists all had to figure out how to worship together and live life together. Um, 
And Buddhists, didn't matter what your sect you all had to, you all had to worship together. It was really hard for Buddhists because almost all of the Buddhist priests had been rounded up in the days after Pearl Harbor and sent to Justice Department camps. So they were imprisoned separate from their congregations. Because they were Buddhist, they were deemed to be a suspect, whether or not they were. Um, so these, these, uh, these Buddhist congregations often didn't have their priests to help lead them. Um, and that was yet another way of saying, you don't really count as an American because the way you worship is suspect. Initially, the military also banned all Japanese language books except Christian Bibles and hymnals in the camp. Um, anything written in Japanese was seen as suspect and subversive. But several Protestant missionaries who were on leave from Japan argued against such a policy and they even offered to translate or, or, or review any book that was going into the camp and let, let the military know if they were fine. Um, they argued that if you're denying, especially that the Issei who spent their entire lives working really hard and all of a sudden are thrown into camps with no work, what are they going to do? So you deny them reading material, you're only gonna lower their morale and make things worse for them. To be told, you're so unworthy to us that you don't even get a book to read. I don't know, that sounds pretty awful, right? <laughs> Um, so they offered their knowledge and, and uh, they also explained to the military authorities the difference between, say, Buddhism and Shintoism, which was a, the nationalistic sort of uh, Japanese cult that was driving the emperor uh, in, in, in Japan. Um, so that suggested that, that Buddhism was not a threat to Americanness, but, but Shintoism might be a threat to both American and Christian ideals. So this work by, by white missionary allies did help the Buddhist population reestablish religious communities in the camp to an extent. Um, so by the time they got to the, the, the camps, they had access to their books, but they didn't necessarily have their, their priests. Um, another way that they were denied their rights as uh, full rights as, as citizens was that the, um, the war relocation authorities put a cap on how much anybody who worked in the camp could be paid at $19 a month. Because $19 a month was how much the lowest paid enlistee in the army was making a month. So you could be a doctor with years of experience, you were only gonna make $19 a month working in the camps. And it went down to $14, 16 to $14. But they also refused to the pastors of the churches, the pastors and priests, they said, we're not gonna pay you because we're, we're having a strict separation of, of church and state. So that meant that many pastors and priests who wanted to serve their congregations also had to find a full-time job. Um, luckily for the, the Protestant, Protestant pastors, most of the denominations decided to carry, to pay for the, pay those salaries to those, those pastors during the time of, um, here's another view on the camps. Here's the churches, here's the Buddhist church. And here we can see uh, one of the Protestant churches and uh, we post 1943. So here we can see a termination notice. Someone has gotten a short term leave somewhere. Um, so she's lost her job at $16 a month. This was important because while they did receive three meals a day in, in, the, um, in the dining halls, there was no money left over to buy anything extra to buy clothes that you needed, to buy food to feed your children, who as we all know, kids get hungry in between meals, um, to buy books or stamps or medical care or, um, or anything else, or to set money aside for when you might eventually leave. One of the really interesting things uh, was that, uh, and, and here's, a, here's a, a leave notice, and you'll see, in order to leave, they had to, they had to go through a long process of being cleared by the military and by the State Department um, and by the War Relocation Authority. And then they'd be given a, a letter or a photo ID that would allow them to leave the camps, but it would also be identity. Anybody could ask for your proof that you have a right to be outside of the camps and you'd have to show this. And you could be sent back at any time as well. So it was interesting as, as the denominations decided, uh, the Protestant denominations decided to pay their, their male pastors, some of their wives actually jumped up. Wives who, pastors' wives never get paid for their work. Pastors' husbands now too, now we have that, but they never get paid. But some of these women said, you know what, 
I am providing an invaluable service to these women in the camps. And if I have to take a full-time job, I won't be able to serve the women in the camps who have real needs at this time. And so they actually got a number of the Protestant denominations to pay them a monthly stipend also. They also said, oh, my husband will take his $19 and he uses it to help support all the other families in the camp, and therefore I have nothing for my own children. So all of that worked, and for that time period, I think Japanese American women, uh, pastors' wives in the incarceration camps were the only pastors' wives to ever get paid for their work. Standing up for their rights, claiming, claiming their place in the country. Now I do find it interesting that uh, in, in 1942, uh, as we get an idea about how, how they kind of push back against these ideas, um, some feathers flew after some of the Nisei second generation in the camps complained that some of the well-meaning white Protestant missionaries who visited the camps, teaching and preaching at the churches and offering pastoral care, um, made too much reference to Japanese culture and language. According to the Nisei, these former missionaries, and I love the, the, I love the irony, these former missionaries were having difficulty, quote, making adjustments to American life and loyalty. The ultimate irony for citizens behind bars because they were suspect Americans by virtue of their race and supposed religious affiliation. So you have white missionaries who they're saying they're not American enough. <laughs> they don't remember what it means to be American, but we as Japanese Americans can tell you this. Yeah, they were pushing back because one of these missionaries in a 1942 Thanksgiving sermon to the youth exhorted the youth to be good and not selfish. Here they are in camps. They've been torn away from their schools and their friends, their neighborhoods, everything. They don't know what's going to happen to them and their families. We need to be good and not selfish because your behavior will be determined by how the outside, meaning white America, judged not only Japanese Americans but Japan. He concluded his speech with a lot of platitudes that showed insensitivity to, to the demoralization and fears faced by people whose citizenship rights had been torn away from them and were living in substandard housing behind barbed wire. He concluded his sermon by saying, at this Thanksgiving time, give thanks that you have a chance to prove your courage and strength. The life is easy here, he said, but you must not be content. Hardships do bring reward. So even from the Allies, they had to they had to push back and say, "Hey, wait, <laughs> this isn't right. This isn't right. What's happening to us?" So after the war, one interesting thing was uh, the the Protestant denominations were many of them were really happy that 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 in the in in the camps all of the Christian. Protestant Japanese Americans had to worship in one congregation together because, as John can tell you, a big dream <laughs> in the early mid 20th century of Protestant denominations was that we would get rid of denominations and be one church together. And so this was sort of their experiment. And I think most of us don't like being other people's experiments. But when you are a captive population, you get to be experiments. Um, so Japanese Americans pushed back against this. They pushed back against the hope of their denominations for the total collapse as well of Japanese American ethnic churches after the war. Um, they, the hope had been that Japanese Americans would all assimilate into white churches, that Japanese American pastors would be happy being assistant pastors to white pastors at churches elsewhere after the war. Instead, many reconstituted their pre-war congregations when they returned to the West Coast or they created Japanese or multiracial congregations with other, other groups in their new neighborhoods outside of the exclusion zone where second and third generation Japanese American pastors honed a liberation theology that spoke to the experience of dispossessed citizens and residents in America. So they yet again said, being American doesn't mean that we have to be just like everybody else or we have to merge our way completely into white America. We have our own space and our own experience that we are going to, to celebrate. The incarceration experience also opened doors for new expressions and growth for the Buddhist church, which had become a preferred alternative for young Japanese Americans alienated from the America they thought they knew and who were searching for a culture and a history of their own. At the start of the war, probably about 70% of first generation and about 40% of second generation Japanese Americans identified as a Buddhist. 
during that first year in incarceration camps, every survey they had to fill out, they said they were Christian because it was not safe to say they were Buddhist. But by the, by the end of the incarceration experience, many of them decided that they, they wanted to embrace Buddhism. So as early as February 15, 1942, the Buddhist mission of North America decided to change its name to the Buddhist Churches of America and cut all ties with the, the Buddhist Church in Japan. Divorcing itself from Japan, uh, the, the, the American Buddhism formed a new path in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the camps under new leadership. Uh, since many of the Buddhist priests who had all received their training in Japan were in Department of Justice camps, Buddhists in the camps identified and raised up new leadership from among the Nisei Nis 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 leaders of the Young Buddhist Association. But, and again, Buddhist affiliations surged and they, they tried to incorporate into, into their lives in the camps American activities like dances by adapting to Buddhism, Christian worship practices. They, they, they had a, a Buddhist service book or Gatha book. They started doing hymn singing. But also in the camps, they celebrated uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist holidays and festivals. Um, so incorporated that in to say, you know, we can be American by doing some things in our worship that may be a little more recognizable as, as kind of Christian-like things or American, but we can also celebrate Buddhist holidays and Buddhist ways of being, which was very important to push back. Um, Duke, Duncan Williams claims that the decision of many Nisei to choose Buddhism while in a camp that clearly symbolized the, the religious and racial exclusion of families like theirs was a statement that even if America momentarily failed in fulfilling its ideal of freedom, their actions and deeds in camp would affirm that being Buddhist and being America was, American was possible in the land of the free. So Nisei, Nisei claimed Buddhism as their own faith during the incarceration and made it their own. And as a result, Buddhism has flourished. So many people you may know today who are Buddhist are not Asian American. They, they, may, be, they may be European American, uh, coming from different places, but it, it has become a part of, of, of America. Now it was not uncommon during the war to hear statements from Japanese Americans like, I feel like a lost sheep in a lost generation or I have an American heart and a Japanese face that I can't take off. All of us who've been parents, it breaks our hearts when we hear our children say things that deny who they are. And it breaks my heart as I read, I read the letters and the writings that, 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 that convey what so many young Japanese Americans were experiencing at this time. Feelings of alienation from their country were strong as Japanese Americans received so many messages that told them that they were not wanted and did not belong. For many of the Nisei, the support of allies like Rhodes and even the paternalistic missionary who didn't seem to understand American ideals were appreciated as efforts to widen the circle of inclusion. As one Nisei noted, their presence provided some Japanese Americans with the quote, much needed moral booth bolstering in an otherwise hopeless and helpless battle for our rights. And expressed hope that when they felt that the future is indeed very dark and democracy and justice is just a mockery, they had people who they could count on. Japanese Americans also crafted their visions of a brighter America that had room and acceptance for their own religious understandings that had room and acceptance for people who look like them and that emerged from the wisdom of that hard battle for their rights and a pride in the traditions, cultures, and history that they added to our national identity. So what their experience showed a growing country was that Christian and Buddhist Asian Americans are indeed American and the circle of identity continue to expand. And we talked about briefly after the horrors of 9-11, the Japanese American community was among the first to speak up against the hate crimes committed against Muslim Americans. Pointing to their own history, Japanese Americans warned the United States against racial profiling. The alignment of the two communities remained close in 2017 as Japanese Americans joined the many interfaith and ethnic groups protesting President Trump's two travel bans as racially and religiously motivated. As author Gil Asakawa has noted, Japanese Americans viewed Trump's campaign talk of a registry for Muslims as, quote, 
The same problem with internment, putting people into categories. Methodist pastor Derek Nagano contends that Japanese Americans have been speaking out against what appears to be racially and religiously motivated bias because of their unique history as Americans who were incarcerated as enemy aliens. They have a special responsibility to tell their stories, to educate others, and to take a stand. Now, it's been noted that in the recent last year or so, with the, the increase of, of violence against Asian Americans, that there has not been a huge outpouring of people supporting them. But perhaps with their show of support for others, we can do the same. That we can educate ourselves and support our neighbors and fellow Americans. Now this, we see this today, we see this around, but this was, uh, this is my last slide here, a racial epithet that was painted on the garage door of a Japanese American in the early 1940s as they were, um, as, as the exclusion zone was lifted and they tried to return to their home. There were a lot of terrorist actions that were committed against Japanese Americans and their homes and properties. Um, you can only imagine after being away from home for so many years to come back and find that. Just a reminder. I can get send this to Maria Angela, but there, there's a huge list of, of, of books, and I, I've just kind of pulled out a few, depending on what you're interested in, but I think a really great site is the dentshow.org uh, website. They have an encyclopedia, they have uh, collections that you can look at of, of original primary sources, um, and it's a great site. If you just want to learn about one little topic, you can look, read, read an, an article that has been written by a scholar or activist and, and give you some real great insight if you don't want to pick up a whole book. A couple of novel, novels, uh, Mineo Kubo, Citizen 13660. She was an artist. She drew these cartoons and kind of wrote about in a little diary her, her experience. Um, John Okada, No No Boy, uh, about those uh, novel about the young men who she chose to respond negatively to those questions on the loyalty questionnaire um, and a few other books. So I'm, I'm happy for any questions for a couple minutes. Bill. Uh, we were shortly in the World War with not only the Japanese, but the Germans in Japan. And uh, a lot of people, at least early on, feel that the Germans were much more horrific but we only really distrusted the Japanese. And a lot of people think that's because they're the one country that attacked us on our shores. The other countries didn't come here. They actually were purposeful to come here and attack us. So we would result, we would react to them in a different way because they would be aggressive. I think that has something to do with it, but it seems like maybe more of it is racial profile. It's, I don't know. But I think we certainly can be understood, at least a little bit, why we would treat them more harshly than the other countries that never came here and back up. So uh, his, his comment was uh, about the, the wondering if, if part of it, besides the racial profiling, was that the Japanese uh, military did attack U.S. land, whereas Germans and Italians did not. And actually, Germans did. There were attempted submarine landings, U-boats. There was sabotage, um, all the sabotage in Hawaii that happened prior to uh, to December uh, 7th was by German Americans who were working undercover, not a single Japanese American. So it really, if, if you, as a historian who's spent a lot of time looking through stuff and reading stuff and, 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 and reading the other um, it has been shown very definitively that it was 100% racial profiling in the determinations and decisions that the government made. The government could have decided, we don't care if people are getting worried about Japanese Americans, we're going to tell them are, they are as American as everybody else, which the government did with German Americans and Italian Americans. Remember in World War I, German Americans were treated Pretty horribly. They weren't incarcerated in camps, but there was a lot of discrimination against German Americans during World War I. The government was intentional to allay fears and concerns at every level of the government, but the federal government also made intentional decisions to portray Japanese Americans as 
um, as an enemy, and when there were opportunities and ways set forward in which the, 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 the government could follow due process, chose not to follow due process. Uh, to what extent did uh, language or the complications of Japanese language compared to Western Europe language is so complicated? The uh, understanding, communication, decisions. So uh, the question is how much did, did uh, language uh, create complications? And it's interesting because even at the start of World War II, um, Japanese, German American and Italian American immigrant company, uh, 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 immigrant communities were as tightly knit as Japanese American uh, immigrant communities, and not because of discrimination. There was not the discrimination for landowning or where you could buy property or rent property or what jobs you could have if you were a German or Italian immigrant as there were for Japanese immigrants. There were not laws saying you couldn't immigrate even um, for, for them. Um, so they were as tight knit, they were as likely to be speaking, the first generation to just be speaking um, the language from the country from which they had come as were um, first generation Japanese residents in the United States, immigrants to the United States. Um, so I don't know that that was, and, and also for that too, I mean we had strong, the government had so much proof of so much pro-Nazi sentiment among the German American community. Much more proof of German Ameri of Nazi, pro Nazi sentiment in the German American community than they had in the Japanese American community of pro uh, and Japan sentiment. Um, so I would think the, the language would be less an issue than the fact that the people who spoke Japanese looked so different than the people who held power. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes? Um, what was the connection to study Japanese history? What, so the question is what, what led me to start studying uh, history, Japanese American history. I, um, I had started looking at it as an undergrad in, I, I'm from California, I went to the University of California. I, in my, California history class, I did research at UC Berkeley, um, looking at the evacuation of Japanese Americans. And um, I know I probably read some books. I don't think even then, growing up in the 70s and 80s in California, I don't think we were taught it in schools. Um, my, my dad's best friend from seminary was Japanese American. He was from Canada, so he was not incarcerated, but his wife was incarcerated. Um, their daughter and my big sister had the same birthday, so we often shared together. So I knew a little bit from them, but otherwise, I think I was pretty clueless. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a, the government influence was going to make sign this law, or did it? Did it sign a law for Japanese to go into the tournament only after the government said? Roosevelt has an interesting, really interesting, complicated relationship with, with Asia. On one hand, a fascination. On the other hand, great prejudice. He was a very prejudiced man. Um, Eleanor, Eleanor argued against him for all of this. And in fact, she would visit the camps and, um, and let it be known that she was opposed to what was happening to Japanese Americans. But, he, um, he, had, he had a report sent to him by someone that, he, he had several people making reports, and, the, you know, and, and he had his little band of advisors, and some were saying, you know, this report that you're looking at is full of holes, it's inaccurate, it's wrong, it's not reliable, but he chose to rely on it, he allowed it to be printed and published, that suggested that, that Japanese uh, Americans were responsible for sabotage, for example, and that they were all on, on, on Hawaii. Um, so he had his choice. He had advisors who opposed doing this and said this is not right, and he had others who said a Jap, once a Jap, always a Jap, can't trust them. And he chose to go with the ones who uh, were in favor of, of, of removing Japanese Americans from daily life. 
Yeah, so she asked how many, about how many people were incarcerated. 100, about 120,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated. Everyone from babies, babies and toddlers who were orphans and might be in foster care in a non-Japanese American family were pulled from those foster families or from orphanages and put into the camps. All the way to older adults, so 120,000 people. Just let me see, is there any other questions, and then we'll come back to you. I just want to say that um, when I worked in Colorado, I had our office secretary was Japanese, and probably the loveliest person in the whole building. She was really kind, soft-spoken, no one that sense of negativity. Yeah, so talk about a, 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 a colleague in Colorado. And a lot of people, Colorado had a good sized uh, Japanese American community before uh, the war, and then many more immigrated there. And that created some issues actually. The people who were already there were sort of worried that, that, that they would get painted negatively um, as, as, as other folks settled. And I think, yeah, did you want to ask one more question? Yeah. Sorry. He, he did have preferences for, he felt more comfortable in upper, upper white uh, society, but he definitely was racist against uh, Asian Americans and against African Americans, unfortunately. Um, Greg Robinson, who I have down here, A Tragedy of Democracy, has a great book looking at Roosevelt through this process. Um, so if you want to really dive in and do a great nerdy read, it's a, it's a really great book. I thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us today. This was great. Thank you all so much for coming. Please feel free to take some, some snacks and things with you on the way out. And uh, join us next month for our next forum on the Hill. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.